Okay, welcome to Writing Cumbria Now, a reading and conversation with two contemporary Cumbrian poets. I'm a Cumbrian poet, my name's Polly Atkin, and this is... I'm Kate Davis, and uh, I'm from Barrow in Furness. So um, we're going to talk to you today a bit about our work, read a bit of our work, and chat a bit about what Cumbria and, and place kind of means in our work as well. Um, so Kate, obviously you grew up in Cumbria. Um, do you want to start off and say a bit about what role Cumbria plays in your work and, and read some poems maybe? Yeah, I, um, yeah I've, I've always lived here. I live on the Furness Peninsula. So now I live on Walney Island, right off the end of the Furness Peninsula. But I was born about eight miles away. So inland, there was the sea on both sides and in front of me as well. Uh, but it was a slightly different landscape. Whereas here it's salt marsh and it's flat and it's uh, glacial clay. Um, where I lived, it was uh, hillier, more wooded and limestone. It was a limestone landscape. And, uh, and I think that is the most defining thing about my growing up was that, that stone that I lived on, the huge, uh, huge chunks of it everywhere. Massive chunks, which for no particular reason, they were just lying around as if someone had thrown them, you know, and the wood was just growing out of big limestone boulders. The hill next to my house was just, was just a, a mass of loose, well not loose, it was obviously in the ground, but huge limestone boulders for no particular reason, uh, you know. So I've, I've always been hugely attracted to limestone in any form. Whenever I see it, and I can tell it, it's a limestone landscape, and it's got those bits of rock sticking through the ground, I'm immediately attracted there. I immediately think if I'm on a train, that looks so interesting. I'd love to go there. There will be something interesting on that bit of ground somewhere. It's, um, That's really interesting about the, the landscapes that get imprinted on us when, when we're young uh, as well. Because I, I have a similar feeling about um, the, the kind of um, rolling hills with woods on the crest that are very particular to the Midlands. Um, well, they're not particular to the, the Midlands, but there's a, there's a lot of them in the Midlands. And when I see them in other places, I do get this kind of like this weird atavistic twinge. Um, and even though it's a landscape I've wanted to, to move away from um, in some ways, it, it still, it, it kind of twangs something whenever I see something that reminds me of, of that. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. It's it's almost subconscious in in some respects, isn't it? That you are it, you're instinctively drawn to that thing that that's like like a little chicken. You know, you open your eyes and you're looking around, and and this is what you see, and and it's immediate. And then when you see it again uh, in the future, it's uh, it's familiar, and it's it's got a sense of something that you that you know, you know, inside that you that you're familiar with. Um, yeah, and so that and that really that's the thing that's occupied me. I think all my life really, um, the stone, the landscape, and not in a kind of picturesque sort of way. I, in fact, I rarely look at the landscape because because I had polio, I spend all my time looking at the ground. <laughs> so I don't very often, I, don't, I do look up obviously, but not while I'm walking, you know, I'm, I'm always looking down. So, so it's not a landscape in a kind of, isn't this beautiful kind of way. It's literally the ground under my feet, which is, is the thing that occupies me. And as I say, it's mainly, I think, because I trip up all the time, you know, so I'm always looking, I'm always looking at the floor, I'm always looking at the ground, I'm always counting my steps, it's my, one of my, one of my ways of keeping myself safe when I'm out in an urban environment is counting, so I count every single step, and, and I pattern my steps and my footsteps in a particular way, it's like, it's like a hugely exaggerated and very overcomplicated version of, you know, um, don't stand on the cracks, yeah, you know, that kind of thing. It's much more complicated than that, and there are things that I need to achieve. It doesn't like it doesn't freak me out when when things go wrong, you know, when when the pattern doesn't doesn't work out. But that patterning of my footsteps and the way I get around is like one of my little safety spells. So that's amazing, <laughs> and that, that's in that appears in one of your your poems. Yeah, it's just one it? of the one of the counting poems. And yeah. it's, um, patterns, in fact, it's pattern spell. Yeah. Um, so, so the numbers, uh, the numbers depend on, you know, on odds and evens and being able to make a picture of them. I count everything all the time, to be honest, Polly, but particularly footsteps. Um, I'm obsessed with number and patterns. So if I was on a bus, I'll, I'll count people on the bus. Um, if I'm driving, I'll even, I'll even be mentally weighing up the patterns of the cars along either side of the road. Um, 
do you think that that's um, partly a distraction technique? It, it, is it something you've done since childhood? Yes. I remember coming home from one of the hospital things. Mm. Uh, I've been in hospital sometimes. And I remember looking up and trying to count stars and trying to work out the patterns and, and put them into a pattern that, that suited my needs sort of thing and realising that I couldn't do it. So I know, and I was on my dad's shoulders when that was happening, so I know I was very young, you know, so, um, but, but I mean, I didn't do the counting footsteps thing where, when I was a child at home because the ground was rough. There was no point. There was no, the patterns there were just the patterns that the ground provided. It's only when I'm in a, in a built up environment. In a environment. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and I still do. I can't, you know, I can't not do it. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. I'm yeah. so interested in that. But do you want to read us some poems um, before yeah. I start asking um, too many questions? I about won't read pattern spell because it's just a lot of counting up to <laughs> in various various patterns. Um, maybe um, I'll start with um, Peninsula because that's about my sense of um, the trustworthiness of the ground, really. Uh, as I said, well, because limestone is is cast, it's a cast landscape and it's soluble and it dissolves. Um, I reckon you just can't trust it. Um, having said that, I love a sinkhole. Oh my goodness, give me a sinkhole problem and I'll, I'll watch it repeatedly. Uh, so it, but also, it, sinkholes are amazing unless you go into one. I think like they're, they're they're amazing because they're terrifying. I know. <laughs> Yeah, it's that looking over the edge. I'm not looking, but you can't not look, can you? So yeah, so this is um, this is um, a, a, program, a poem about the ground. This is Peninsula. We never speak of it, but here we know the land cannot be trusted. So a woman might reach out her hand towards a rail in Debenhams, and for a fraction of a second, she knows the earth beneath the town is shifting as limestone lays itself open to rain Grains of sandstone slacken, then let go. Cracks in old mine shafts expand, and another gram of soil slips sideways without a sound. She picks out a dress in pink, holds it up to her friend, and they laugh, link arms on their way to Costa, sit mocker as the Permo Triassic rocks dip further west. The glacial sediments of Walney drift towards the spits, and the peninsula hunches down in the astounding wind. I love that one. I, I love the image of the peninsula hunching down as well, like, like it's a, a beast, it's a, it's a living landscape, isn't it? Mm. It very much is actually, and it always seems to be, it, it barely, the whole of Walney, it barely rises out the sea, you know, really. Um, I mean, like all coast areas, it's, it's pretty flat, but it is just basically a lump of, um, you know, um, stone that's been deposited like the spits are actually extending at the ends um, and glacial clay that was deposited at the end of the last ice age so there's not an awful lot keeping it out of the water um <laughs> which is quite nice i like i like the i mean i never think anything's permanent really in terms of landscape not just somewhere like walney which is quite vulnerable in that respect yeah, anyway, but, it, but just it's just a feeling of, of 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 edginess where it does. Um, it, it, it it's wearing its liminality mm. and it's mm. as you say it's vulnerability very much on the outside isn't it it is yeah very much um but but mountains and everything i just feel that they're they're all in a, in a state of flux aren't they i mean you you live in an area which is grand with you know with huge you know soaring peaks and, and that kind of thing but to me when i look at them i just kind of think they're all changing. All those, yeah. all those things are actually still changing. Do you ever get that sense when you when you there, or does it feel permanent? No, I mean, I, I think because like you, I'm very aware of of the particularity of the ground under my feet, and and share that sense of not trusting the ground. Um, I mean, I can fall off anything. I can just fall off a piece <laughs> of completely flat ground. So I know really it's in some ways it's me it's my body that's not trustworthy um but because of that i do have an awkward relationship with mm -hmm. the ground yeah um and particularly with um slippery ground or, or um uh things like scree as well i find particularly oh, yeah. um uh unpleasant to walk on um but just that that sense that uh, even a single path is continually shifting under you and i know we were talking about this the other day that, that oh, when yeah. you're, when you're um, very familiar with a path and you know if you are a disabled walker and you're looking down at the path a lot because you're thinking about where you you put your feet 
um, you often know that past very intimately mm. as well, don't you? So you notice yeah. all those, those tiny little shifts. And um, so I guess to me, it, it feels like the mountains feel more like the ocean, that they're, they're one thing, which is always going to be one thing, you know, that they're always going to be the ocean, but then they're continually in this state of flux at, at the same time. Mm. Um, and something that I became very aware of when I first moved here was um, how involved you are with the water table uh, oh, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. as well, that you can't kind of avoid that sense. That, um, I, I remember this very intense feeling when I, when I first moved here um, and I did write about it in, I think, a couple of poems that never got published actually, um, of this feeling of permeability that I hadn't really experienced when I was living in London beforehand. Um, that um, I was a porous thing that water was le leaching into and then back out of into the ground and then back into this this water system. Wow. Mm. And did, did you say that that only really occurred to you when you when you moved up to the Lake District? Yeah, it's completely. Really yeah. yeah, and and um, I, it it <laughs> kind of became um, epitomised. Uh, for me by by thinking about the different shoes that I, I was wearing, you know, all of my city shoes mm. uh, that I kind of, kind of trotted around on coming out of the tube, going to mm. parties and things and going back down into the tube again, were suddenly completely redundant. Um, and I was just covered in mud and coal dust all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and also wet most of the time as yeah, well. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's really interesting, actually, that, that there is something about, um, you know, because everything's stripped away when when you're in a you're, you're in a rural environment you know you haven't got the tarmac and the pavement between yeah. you and the water table and what's underneath i tend to be always like i'm always half aware of it so you know i look at things like like the town hall and it and it's so big you know baritown it's, it's just a town hall but i look at it and i think yeah but underneath you there's all those mm. white roots and worms and stuff and they've been there for a long long time and they're just waiting until you're not there and they're going to grow again you know but you lose that sense of of um, things being hidden it's it's right there in front of you when you like you see when you're walking and, and you suddenly realize you are up past your ankles in water and these shoes are not going to do it you're suddenly very aware of how close you are to you know the environment it's yeah uh, like a, a level of pretense is stripped away isn't it that yeah. i think yeah. sometimes in urban environments you can kind of um pretend that you're not involved with those things i remember having a really big argument um with uh, a poet who was a, a poet in residence here um, who, who tried to claim that it never rained in London. And I was like, no, I mean, I, it definitely rained in London. I, I, and not long before I left London, um, I had one of those experiences where I got literally soaked to the skin. Like I, I might as well have jumped in a fountain um, walking between one event and, and another event. Like uh, you know, completely completely yeah. drenched like coming up like like I was um some kind of drowned girl um <laughs> out out of a horror movie um uh and but I think a lot of the time you're removed from those experiences in the city because you'll just dash into a, a shop or yeah. into yeah. into a pub um or into the tube and I was only more aware of that because um I didn't have the money to get a tube fare or a bus fare that day. So I had, I had to walk, uh, which I spent a lot of my time in my last years of London doing, having to walk between places. So I did become more aware of that than I think a lot of people are in the city. But it still didn't prepare me for how different that was when I moved here. And you, you're, just, you're just in the elements all the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I get the same sense of shock when I go to a city. I literally, I get off the, I get off the train and I always, I always find myself doing this. I get off and I look around and go, oh, this is nice, isn't it? Wherever I am, it's just such a treat to be somewhere, somewhere like that. It's exciting. It's got that sense of possibility about it. But without fail, within the first 20 minutes, I'll walk into the road at the wrong time, you know, and I'll have horns blasting and that kind of thing. And I have to, it does take me a couple of days before I feel not just I know where I'm going, but I feel like I know how to get mm. around in the city, how to check what to look for and those kind of things. But if you put me in, you know, out on the beach or anywhere around, you know, around here, I'd, I'd be absolutely fine. But in a city, I am a little bit lost and I'm a bit of a danger to myself and other, <laughs> other people for a, for a short while until I, until I get, um, 
until I get my sort of sense of how to stay safe back again. Um, you were talking about, um, we were talking about this the other day and you mentioned Nottingham and your sense, of, oh, it was when we were talking about a sense of, of belonging, wasn't it? Yeah. That was, uh, you, you were saying um, what it was like um, for you returning to Nottingham, but it wasn't in a safety sense, it was more about a sense of place, wasn't it? Well, although in some ways it is actually, so maybe I'll read that poem, um, which is, uh, called in the city I was born in. So um, after I first moved to Grasmere and um, moved here because I was doing a PhD um, here at the Wordsworth Trust, um, and then um, I moved when I ran out of funding with my PhD. So in my writing up year, um, I did what I thought was a very sensible thing and moved back to to Nottingham. And I was um, I'd suddenly got quite poorly at the time as well, which eventually was what. Um, uh, led to my diagnosis some years later as well. Um, but at the time, um, all I knew was that I'd kind of gone home um, and but kind of a bit by accident um, in, in some way. Um, and I just really missed um, being up here um, so much and it, it didn't feel like um, a home in that way. Um, so this is in the city I was born in. In the city I was born in, it snows all day, but shows nothing of it. Its pavements smudge or stain as with rain, or are pressed under ice, smooth and opaque after weeks of compression, smattered with town dirt like shot. A thin wind snaps round its sharp cornered streets. People fall where they stand. The snow is fast and light, insistent. I've traveled inland as far as I can, but no sign can come, and now I am stuck. City I was born in, you should know I've not come here to die, but not unlike it, to stop for a while. Somewhere a body like mine is lying in a bed of its own, and a house of its own, which blue drifts smooth to a glacial barrow, while ice builds urgent weight at its windows, and stars plummet down on threads like spiders to light the dreamer's gaping mouth. Can you honestly say I belong to you, city that refuses to comply with the national weather, sole grey smear on a whited out map? You are not my end point, barely my home. I'm a spider tumbling into your yawn. I see you are more afraid than I am. Your grey day is dimming. The man I love stands at his door looking into your shadows and says without turning, something is falling, something is falling, but nothing settles. That's just such an astonishing poem. The images in it, the, uh, the people falling where they stand and, the, and those ideas about death, it being not death, but something like it. It's so moving, Polly, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And, and every, the signal that the uh, sun has come out here that a couple of high speed military jets have just flown over. They <laughs> 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 they pass me on the way up to you. Yeah, there's another one. Yeah, um, it's usually two. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So, so uh, yeah, I felt like I was kind of on pause in in a way, um, having kind of felt like I'd. Um, uh, got into a different part of my life and then had to kind of roll back a bit, um, which was a, a kind of, and I was in a very in-between state. So I was living kind of half of my parents' house, which they were trying to sell at the time, the house that I grew up in, which they did eventually sell. Um, and half in my partner's um, mouldy studio flat, um, which was in the basement of what used to be the city hospital in Nottingham, mm. which my mum moved to Nottingham to to work at in, in the 60s. So she's she's from Dumfrieshire and she'd moved to Nottingham to work there. And from his flat, you could see the tower that she lived in, which is the the, the kind right. of accommodation. Um, right. So it was a really peculiar kind of mm. round of things that that felt that felt a bit kind of dreamlike and weird in 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 some ways, but also um just a strange situation and and i ended up uh teaching um at a high school in uh in the center of nottingham um uh, a few classes that um they didn't have a teacher to cover so i kind of got flown in so i was teaching things that, that were slightly uh, with my comfort zone 
um, as well, um, which is always a peculiar experience. Um, but one of them was as was classical civilization and literature. Um, so I was thinking a lot about kind of myth and um, myths of homecoming, I suppose, as well, when, mm. when I wrote it. Mm. And you, you mentioned, well, I know we've talked about this in the past as well, uh, how, how relatively quickly you, you felt that Grasmere is very much home. It feels like home to you in, in that very familiar way. Um, I was to say, I've, I've actually never lived anywhere else, but I, I do find that really interesting that, that you have that sense that it's your natural, it's the right place for you to live. Am I right? That it yeah. feels like the right place for you to live. Or, or, or even kind of weirder than that. I just, um, uh, I, I fell in love with it very much kind of at, at first sight. And this, um, one of the, um, the theories I was looking at when I did my, my PhD was this theory um, called topophilia, um, which was, um, put forward by a, a sociologist called Yifu Tuan um, and uh, he writes about it and it's just topophilia so it's love of place um, mm -hmm. and he writes exactly about this how um, anybody can can get a kind of strong attachment to a particular place but it but when I read that I kind of thought oh my god that's kind of what happened to me mm -hmm. I, I came for my interview um, up here for my PhD and by the next morning I kind of woke up and I thought if I don't and, and I hadn't been like thinking this has to be the option for me. I just I, I applied um, slightly on a, a whim because one of my friends said, look, this is kind of what you wanted to do. Why don't you do it? And I thought I didn't want to leave London um, because my whole life was there. All my friends were there. And then I came up here and by the time I'd slept one night in Grasmere, I thought if I don't get this PhD and get to live here, I'm going to die. <laughs> Yeah, this That's is really so interesting. How, how <laughs> fascinating. And one night, so, I mean, you can't even have seen that much. No, so no. Something, um, you know, I, I know I can't, I can't imagine how that works, but that is absolutely fascinating. Um, it's not that I don't like other places. It's just the sense that for me, I, I exist in, in this place and I can't imagine being in any other space really. I can't imagine being in any other kind of landscape really. And it's not that I don't want to go. I just don't want to stay there. I don't want to live there. I don't want to live anywhere else. And, and I, I do think uh, that um, th there's a line that I remember from somewhere, I don't know who wrote it. I haven't been able to find out, although I've tried that, a lane is enough to know in a lifetime. And I get that, so actually when I read that, I thought, yeah, it is. I lived at the top of the lane and I could have spent I knew every stone, I knew where everything was in that, where every flower would bloom, where to find the first celandine, you know, where mm -hmm. to find a wild strawberry. I knew what lived where, and I've, I knew every blade of grass, really, every puddle intimately, because that was my, my home, my life, and it was about half a mile from the village. And, and actually, that, that for me, it kind of is enough, actually, um, to, to know that place. and. When I when I go somewhere else, I do love it, but I've never I've never been anywhere and, and gone, this is the place I want to stay. I've gone, this is absolutely stunning. I'm yeah, really yes. loving being here, but I've never had that. This feels like the place I want to spend the rest of my life. I, I don't know if I would have had quite that version of, of that if I if I hadn't been coming here looking at the possibility of living here, if if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so I, I came here to see whether I'd be allowed to live here. Yeah, right. Um, which then obviously put that that skew on it. Like if I'd just come here as a tourist, I might have just gone, oh, this is this is lovely, but it's not my home. Yeah, um, right. Which is which is a very different thing. But I, I came here at this this kind of peculiar junction in in my life um, where there was this possibility. I I always say um, that I feel like Grasmere was kind of a crochet hook that kind of came into the knitting of my life and just yanked it <laughs> in, in a particular yeah. direction. Whipped a thread out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, then, a... and then changed everything mm -hmm. um, because it, it really did. It, it recentered my entire life. Um, uh, and yeah, and then I didn't want to, to live anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I still think about it, you know, it's it's not like I don't... I'm not interested in other places, 
Um, but I find it very difficult to think about actually living in another place. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Yeah, well, so do I. But like this, yeah. this is this is where I started, and this is where I will I will end. Uh, I'm very aware of that. Um, and the, one of the other things that struck me about familiarity with place, while I was while I was putting the book together, actually. Um, was that sense of, of belonging and I, I always had the sense that the bit of land that I grew up on at the top of that lane eight miles you know up the peninsula half a mile from the nearest village in a wood with that tree there and these trees here and, and that building there that that belonged to me mm. that it was mine and it was still mine and it would be always mine and no matter who lived in that house that I lived in it was still actually belonged to me in some in some respects. I had, you know, but but it was more the ground around the place that I felt, you know, that's my that's my space, that's my place. Until I went back one time and I looked at the path where we'd played and walked. Well, I looked for them and they actually weren't there. They literally weren't there, and that was so shocking um, to to suddenly because in that instant when I thought they're gone they'd moved there was another path somewhere else but it was different because someone else had made it in that instant when I realized that I, I just realized that I hadn't, I hadn't even left a mark on that place I had absolutely no right to it what to 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 assume that it belonged to me in in any way really that I was just literally I'd, I'd passed through it I'd passed over it but I didn't leave a mark um and that was that was uh, yeah quite quite something to I mean I, it didn't take me long to go, well, no, of course it doesn't belong to you. It isn't your, it was never your land anyway, but it wasn't in a kind of ownership sense. It was felt like as if my little child's soul, yeah, yeah it, the, the soul that developed on there, the spirit that developed on that bit of land that whose footsteps, you know, pressed on that bit of land and, and the footsteps I can remember feeling like stones through my, my plinth soles and that kind of thing. I can remember the feeling of the ground under my feet, but actually that didn't give me any right to, um, to to feel that I you know had any more claim on it than anyone else really which um so that was one of the poems that I, I wrote about in the book so um sh shall I read that one now read, read that one yeah um because again it's it's about it's about my relationship with the land although as I say a slightly different relationship this time um yeah um so now that I've come back, now that I've come back and I stand at the edge of the wood with this reckless smell of elderberry and nettles, I thought I knew like a rhyme. Now I'm back, I look around for the way through the wood, the path beaten into cool earth that surely carried the predecessors before it carried me. When I'm here I see there is no path through the wood. The path I walked was the path I made with my feet as I walked. And I have no claim on this place. I never even marked the surface of the land. I understand now that I've come back. I love that so much. Uh, and that idea of, of what we're doing when we make a path, which is something I'm really interested in and keep coming back to um, the relationship between what happens when we walk on a place and, and we we leave our mark but that that mark is impermanent but it's it's also um accumulative in, in that way so um if you walk somewhere very very often um you you do make make this mark that mm. um becomes a, a kind of a, a line on on the place um a kind of map in, in a way um but over time, those, those things will change and um, fade uh, as different people walk them or, or mm -hmm. the paths will move as well. Um, and I'm really interested in that. I, I, realize I, I have a poem about paths um, as well in my collection, but with a slightly different um, angle, that it's a slightly grumpy poem um, <laughs> in some ways, uh, because I wrote it when they were... Um, building a, a cycle path um, or trying to build a cycle path around Grasmere um, and um, I, I don't want to be too too rude rude about this but they, they kind of 
all those kind of knobbly bits that you really love in Woodland Pass, you mm. know, the, the, the bits where they go over, yeah, roots and um, all those, those kind of lovely textural bits that when you are downward lookers like us, uh, they're both hazards, um, but they're also kind of points of beauty that, that you yeah. notice. Um, they wanted to smooth over them all. And they also wanted to kind of create a big wide path that could possibly also be a cycleway, although um, they never kind of properly finished the cycleway um, for both good and bad reasons, because they, they wanted to build a, a, a kind of cob wall along the beach at Grasmere and build the cycle over the top of it, um, which was all part of this, this Im improvement um, that they were on at. Um, but as part of that, they, they put um, this slate surfacing down on all of the paths, um, which now it's kind of worn in a few years, as I knew would happen you get used to and you accept as, as the path. Um, but it was very different to the path that had, that had mm. been before. Um, so this is a new path. And it starts with a, a quote from Greville Lindop, um, which quotes a, a, a kind of famous bit of Wordsworthian lore about the different roads into Grasmere. But this is Greville Lindop's version of it. Dr. Thomas Arnold, as progressive in his views on road building as in his politics, used to tease Wordsworth by referring to the picturesque upper path as old corruption, the road over the common, so the one I take all the time, as bit by bit reform, <laughs> and the new level road as radical reform. Wordsworth was never reconciled to the latter, for the new road cut brutally through Bainwig's wood and destroyed the lonely peace of the lakeshore we take it nonetheless. And what really fascinated me in that quote was it, Greville obviously is writing a guidebook here and, we, and he says, we take it nonetheless. Mm. But I think there is something interesting about that, that process that, that you know, you, you, you could be really angry about something that's different and then you take it nonetheless. Mm. So this is the new path. The new path dislikes color. It is hard like the future. It is gray like the future. It is made of similar smaller parts smashed down to something like stone. A new path means equality against disruption, upset. It cuts your hands when you press on it, testing to see if it tastes of anything, smells of living or dead. The new path is cold on your skin. The new path will flatten everything. Soon enough, you will find yourself chalking your knees on it, weeping quietly with gratitude as it scores your palms with its arrowhead brand. The new path tells us uniformity is perfection. The new path tells us difference is difficult. To be difficult is not to be natural. To be limitless is not to be good. The world is for walking over, not through. It will teach you to move without consequence without transgressing to dirt or resistance. The new path leads to nowhere specific, is always accessible, says, do not try to follow me home. I cannot deliver. I am not for travel. It teaches passivity. Its public name is improvement. It will not remember another. The new path does not like people. The path is dangerous, does not like danger. The tangled world is not ready for its definite stance. The new path seeps away in the woods, scattering its small grey spores. Um, that's amazing. I love that, that uh, you know, that sort of the way you've included the, um, the notion of, you know, how we're expected to get about the world and, and how, we, how we can get about the world. And, and in such a, in such a, um, I don't know what, what is it about it sort of a like what's the word you used not it's not grumpy at all it's very oh um it's like it's like uh someone with a with a huge lot of knowledge the path it taught you know it's the way the way someone who knows a lot about something might speak it's almost you know it's vaguely rude in that sort of slightly patronizing way that some people have that its voice is very much that kind of <laughs> the new path is it, yeah that so the way it's it's describing the new path this this speaker it's um it's stunning and and it's and it is sad that 
the, the lumps and the bumps and the roots, uh, you know, and the rocks and the stuff, we feel that that need to um, to get get rid of them all, make it all mm -hmm. everything. I, I know access is an issue. You know, we're probably getting into tricky ground here. But you know, like you, I I don't think everything needs to be um, done away with, covered up by uh, by greyness to make it. it it's it's weird. I, I mean, my particular problem with that path is that they kept saying that they were doing it for accessibility and to make it more accessible, but the path is still hugely inaccessible. Like you, you couldn't get. Um, it, for, for starters, it's small slate, so you can you can't get a wheelchair over it. Um, right. It's hard enough to get a buggy, and the way they changed the path, there's bits that are actually steeper than they used to be. So they, they've. It's kind of that, um, it's the theatrics of accessibility mm. um, without accessibility, mm. without real accessibility. Like they didn't actually talk to any disabled people. Let's, no. let's get that way. Um, I doubt they even talked to that many mums with buggies because um, they, they put in steps where there didn't used to be steps. And th there's a lot of very confusing on an access level. There's a lot of very confusing things, but then they kept saying, oh, but it's all about making things more accessible for families. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, what it means is by that it kind of means that it, it isn't more accessible, as you say. It's probably less accessible in some ways, but because of the steps and things. But um, but it, but you're not going to get muddy. Mm, you're not going to get muddy on that path, are you? Now we've done away with the mud, folks. So it's all good. It's all yeah, good. It's kind know? of landifying in a in a really interesting way. Um, and, but I was really interested to think about how now it has settled in. I'm used to that that new path being there in a way that I never thought that I I would be. You know, it's kind of um, what I guess five years on from when they did it now, mm. maybe a bit more. Um, and it's uh, hard to remember what the old mm. path looked like. <laughs> that's true of everything that changes. You know, when something changes in an environment, it's so hard to say. You think, oh, you're not going to forget that, but you do, you can't actually quite picture what something was like b before that thing changed. I mean, very much in towns and that kind of thing, but, but in other places as well, you know, so you very quickly, that becomes the norm, doesn't it? That becomes your new, your new normal. And it's very hard to, uh, to remember just what was there before, only a really, really short time ago. Um, yeah, we are, we're strange creatures, aren't we, in that respect, in that just accepting being able to accept you know this is uh, this is an, the normal thing for us now yeah do you want to read another one um what should we read yeah i have I'm, I'm, um one of my um one of my issues with uh, there's bits about sinkholes in here but they're actually kind of found poems and things what about there's a poem called um disaster and a lot of um you know when you're growing up there's always stories around where you live isn't there you know about the the terrible thing i just i was looking i was doing some research for a session i'm doing in, in a couple of days and i came across this picture in the, the archives at barrow and um, that's online and it's called tragedy lane and it's in alderston tragedy lane and the story behind it was was a tragedy uh, and that that's fascinating there's always stories linked to where you are and some of them some of them I made up myself. Some of them were stories that, that I knew about. Um, and a lot of them are terrifying, aren't they, as children? You know, when, like the haunted house in the street or, you know, that kind of thing, you know. Um, and this is um, a poem about, um, it's called Disaster and it's about a, a disaster. It's, it was um, a train fell through, the, the ground literally opened up and a train fell through through the ground. And everyone in the village knew about this story when we were growing up. And that was one of the things that added to my, you know, my my certain knowledge that the ground definitely couldn't be trusted. Because this train was only a few miles away and it fell through the, um, into a huge hole in the ground. So this is called a Disaster. Everyone remembered the story the main line through the next village, ground gashing open, rails bu bu buckling, a train falling, falling, 30, 60, 100 feet still falling, engines gone, earth closing over. The sound of it, they said they could still hear it. The whole tra train fa falling, slow, slowly into and I think it just stayed in the hole yeah I think 
it was at Lindell, which is just a few miles from the village where I lived. So, and that is an area with a lot of holes in it. Yeah. Because uh, it was mined. It was mined hugely. You know, it's a hematite ore was discovered here. And that's how Barrow started to, um, to develop because hematite is the sort of highest grade of, of ore. So they came, they came to mine it. So the whole area, not Walney, um, but the whole area of Barrow, all around the villages, all around here, it's absolutely full of holes. Um, there's, there's a hole up where in Ruse, which is at the back of Barrow, where my husband grew up, they used to play in, in the fields up there. And we were walking up there when it would be about uh, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, maybe. We were walking in those fields and we were both 70 now, so we're probably 25 years ago. Um, we were walking in those fields and he said, when we were kids, what, you know, the mine shafts, were, some of the mine shafts were actually open. It was just an experimental hole but it was still yeah. there and he said when we were kids there was a there was a chunk of wood like a sleeper across the top of that hole of one of those holes over there and we had a rope on it and we used to dangle you know on that rope down there and uh, we went and had a look and there was a bit of a broken old fence around this hole which had just just trodden down and we went and that bit of rope was still on that <laughs> on that wood across that hole in the ground um which is it's hilarious it's terrifying yeah. and it's absolutely fascinating isn't it um that people th it's, it's thinking about that uh, the, the underneath world yeah. isn't it, of yeah. A yeah which is um always fascinating isn't it, it it's fascinating like like you say it's, it's utterly terrifying as well especially when you're really claustrophobic like me but we couldn't believe it when we you know I, I actually i've got another poem it's called hemocyte there's a poem about and that that hole in the ground actually comes yeah. up in that in that poem uh but yeah the, the whole notion of the of the ground not being safe partly is to do with all the mining that, that went on that went on around this area and and um i've got this um there's a little thing on my um it's a little booklet that i downloaded and it's called something like um statutory nuisance mine shafts and and the responsibilities of of local authorities and it's like i call it my geology poem <laughs> It's just, it's just about, and it's got pictures of holes in the ground. I mean, some of them are only a meter, two meters across, mm -hmm. but they might be, you know, fifty foot deep, okay, yeah. and there is nothing to stop you falling in. Some of them are holes in a bank, um, and and a lot of them are just uh, capped off with a bit of corrugated iron or a bit of wood. Sometimes it's concrete, but it's 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 um it's written by uh, it's written with the intention of telling. Um, local authorities what their responsibilities are but it tells you it, it goes into detail about roughly how many of these holes there are across the country and where they are and it's absolutely compelling I absolutely love that thing I'll send you a copy Paul yeah, it <laughs> it's amazing uh, um, I've been thinking a lot about kind of caves in in uh, in my prose work um, right. I've been thinking about because um, Nottingham is, is on sandstone so um, Nottingham right. sitting on top of a network of caves, some of which are very famous um, for various reasons, and uh, uh, and and I I hadn't oddly I'd never really thought about it in in my poetry until I was thinking about this particular this particular incident from my childhood, which I, I find upsetting but also really intriguing, which I've been writing about in in prose, where we went to. Um, uh, this amazing place called Cresswell Crags, which is on the Derbyshire Nottinghamshire border, um, which has the oldest cave heart in Britain. But I, I had quite a scary experience there on a, on a school trip. Um, but but then that made me realise that my entire childhood was just underpinned by caves. That um, you know our um, locker rooms at school were were basements which were dug into the sandstone wow. uh, of um, of the city, which had. <clears throat> tunnels which were blocked off because a lot of the older houses in Nottingham have have tunnels in them underneath as well and like the whole of the centre of the kit it's it, it's really weird when you start to think about it it's amazing um and I'd never really really written about it before which is odd in itself I think um I think because it was so normal in my childhood mm. I guess um that everybody had a cave you know everyone who had a Victorian house we didn't and we were slightly outside of the center. I was always really jealous of my friends who had like a cave in their basement. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> my goodness. And um, were they hollowed out? Did people sort of hollow out the ground underneath? So the yeah. basement, yeah, was dug out of the sandstone. Yeah, so, so because it was sandstone, it was quite um, workable in that way. And um, underneath Nottingham Castle and Castle Rock, there's loads of caves that people used to live in. Um, and they lived there till 
uh, quite late on, I think, um, in some cases until the 20th century. Nice. Um, and now there's like tours that you can go on that show you around the caves. And some of them are like famous ones where um, like the Queen's lover escaped down and, and things like that. Um, some of them are Castle Rock Brewery um, is, is half built into the caves. Um, so there's all of these really interesting histories of the caves um, to the point that, um, uh, yeah, hi historically, Nottinghamians were, were known as troglodytes because they were literally cave dwellers. Yeah. Wow, I didn't I actually didn't know that about Nottingham. But, but yeah. actually, I mean, we, we don't know an awful lot about the ground underneath us on the whole anyway. We kind of do exist pretty much on the surface. I've got a friend who does a lot of potholing and stuff in there. Um, it's so a she tells radio me, program. This, this, yeah, this, that, that, this, that was yeah, the radio. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Earthbound, yeah, Rachel. She, I was talking to. I was really interested in caves from a kind of like a, a, an academic point of view. In that, do, can you tell me about caves and potholing and talking about it? And then she said, "Oh yeah, coming in. You know, we'll we'll get together and I'll, we'll have a chat about caves." She said, "No one ever wants to know about my potholing and caving. You're the first person who's ever asked me." Really, so I went in, and she said, "Oh." Um, she was talking about the smell of caves, uh, the smell of cave clothes as well, um, and what it's like when she goes in a shed at home. Uh, and she can she said, sometimes I go in just to smell it because I can smell the under the underground, the underneath yeah. of the world on those clothes. Um, she said, and it is a very distinct smell. It's not quite like anything else. And um, she said, go on. So I was going to say that, that that's one of the things when I first moved up north, I lived for a bit in a house in um, in Goldgate. All right. And it was a sandstone house. And I liked it like it felt homely to me because it smelt of of Nottingham caves yeah, yeah. Isn't that strange <laughs> so that smell was coming through the walls at you and it's we are we are very sensitive to smells aren't yeah. we you know you can you smell something you're immediately uh, you're immediately back in that environment again yeah oh that's really interesting imagine yeah yeah a house that smells like home yeah I think maybe I mean I live in a brick terraced house but actually when I think about it my house that I uh, grew up in was brick. It was just a little brick, brick built, very badly built, a uh, little brick built bungalow in the in the middle of a, well, just in the edge of a wood really. But yeah, I never thought about that really. I mean, oh, actually in that, in the poem about uh, going back and not recognizing the place, uh, the, you know, it was the smell that made me feel I did belong there. I, and it was, it's, I was thinking it was quite a reckless smell, that that nettle, it's, there's a wildness about the smell of nettles uh, and elderberry and the leaves of elderberry and that kind of thing. But then realizing when I realized the pathway that actually, I, you know, smell or no smell, I, I didn't belong there and it yeah. didn't belong to me. Um, again, it oh, wasn't fascinating. I should, sorry, it wasn't your place anymore. It wasn't my place anymore. But uh, but really interesting. So when you said you've been thinking about caves now, what what, what prompted that? Um, I mean, you said it was an incident in your childhood, or, or how is it how is it manifesting? That's what I'm saying in in your work. Well, I was trying to think about a way to write about. Um, the genetic aspect of my health conditions and how the kind of weird sense of vertigo that you get thinking about that. Um, so um, realizing that I'm the first person in my family to be diagnosed with two conditions that are both genetic, which are both run on both sides of my family. Um, and it gave me a feeling thinking about it, which was like looking into a really deep hole um, and kind of looking into deep time almost. And um, that reminded me of, of the feeling of, of being in these, these caves and walking on this really narrow path um, and kind of being told down one side, there's a bottomless drop and down the other side, there's a, there's a pool where some bodies were found, you know. Um, <laughs> that was still true. <laughs> yeah, although, you know, I don't know how much I misremember it. I was trying to find out in, in the process of writing this piece, which I was kind of writing for, for a couple of years on and off. Um, I, I ended up uh, kind of going to some of my school friends and trying to find out if any of them remembered it. No one remembered that aspect of it at all. Um, but then I know I also experienced different things about places often than, than the people mm. around me. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and we ended up going going back there one day to to look at at look at it as as well. Um, but it's also been in the in the news, Cresswell Crags, in because um, I think in January last year, so in January 2019, um, they found out that there's a lot of graffiti in one of the caves because it's a whole series of caves oh, really? along a gorge, um, and there's a lot of graffiti in one of them that they thought was um, graffiti from 
after dinosaur bones were discovered there and, and then it became a kind of tourist place in, mm. in Victorian times. Um, and they found out that actually they were very uh, much older marks and a lot right. of witch marks, wow. um, which were, were made to keep things in the cave. Mm. Mm. Um, so this sense of kind of uh, what's buried there or not. And, and they, they were very anciently inhabited, the, these caves as well. They were inhabited by, by Stone Age people um, and they left behind all these amazing bits of Stone Age art uh, as well. So it's, a, it's an important archeological site. Um, but there's also loads of fascinating stories to do with it. And then that just made me think about the weirdness of the fact that we left our school, which was on top of a load of caves to go and look at some caves somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> and, and how that feels like a, a very kind of Nottingham thing to do, but I'd never really thought of it before. I think sometimes, you know, when you have, the, have a distance from a place, it allows mm. you to think about it mm. slightly mm. differently. In a different way. way. Yeah, it's interesting what you said about, I'm not sure if that was, if that was actually a story, if it was real or if I made it up kind mm -hmm. of thing. And I do that quite a lot. It's very hard to know those things like you were fairly sure there was a, there was a bottomless pit on one side and bodies <laughs> on the other, you know, you, and you've gone through your life knowing yeah, that exactly. the bodies <laughs> and the bodies, but I do that quite a lot. And then I think to myself, or I, I find myself saying something and I go, I'll, I'll state it as a fact and I go, oh, what if I just made that up? Did I, did I did I imagine that? Did I is it a dream or like you? Is it something that I've kind of embroidered over the years? And and um, it doesn't bother me really that I find it quite hard to you know so so whether something is a memory yeah uh, the place that I grew up whether that whether that thing is as I remember it probably isn't or whether I drank it or whether I just made it up. I, I I very much have that problem with dreams as well though because my dreams are so vivid and I'm often in, like we'll be in the middle of saying to somebody but uh so and so said and then i'll be like oh no that was a dream <laughs> no, I yeah. that there, was, there was something in in the uh arena of the story that that was too improbable and then go yeah. oh no yeah, yeah. <laughs> that just, the deal. <laughs> i just i don't know what time i don't know how we're doing for time actually we, we've, we've only got about five minutes oh, uh, well, all right, okay. so we, we ought to read another yeah. poem each maybe do you want to read another yeah, one then, um I've watched, what should we read? Something to do with landscape. Let's just have them. Um, well, they're nearly all to do with landscape, to be honest. Well, uh, the pins, everything really. So, yeah, absolutely, it does. Um, what about um, oh, Boulder Drift? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. 51. Um, I read, I, I read quite a lot of geology books. I still do actually. Although I find it very hard to hang on to the facts about geology and have to keep going back and, and think, what's just get what's nice and what's what's just and what's this thing. I, I forget geological facts quite quickly, but this came out of reading um, uh, reading a, a pamphlet um, uh, about this this particular area from a geologist in about 1870 something, 1873, I think it was. Okay, Boulder Drift. She thought of rock, a mad disorder of it, dragged by glaciers and held in this red clay. The men who mined here called it Pinnell. And though she'd never known that word, she would not have liked the name. Not liked its mean, mocking little it sound. Its nod to the town's thin, cold ginnels. Its hint of fixing in place. Pinned on display, like an insect. She'd have preferred the one geologists gave it, boulder drift, to imagine those stones suspended, all weight gone, their pockmarked bodies lifted and held like dancers. To think of drifting, a sugar steely blown from weeds, weightless, the ironwork gone from her body. To think too of being bolder, braver, now that would have been something. She'd have been glad to think of it there under her feet, glad it had survived its mauling, and comforted by its kindliness in covering those older stones, the earth's bones. Mm, I love that. I love the earth's bones. It's so lovely. The, the limestone sticking through the soil always looked to me, even as a child, like bones, and it still yeah. does actually, because it's quite white as well quite often. Yeah. Sometimes it's uh, greys and it's like it, but, but it is quite... Um, quite like bone sticking through and, the, and the, the soil is thin it's so thin it's just like skin on a yeah, uh, yeah. on a limb yeah so uh, which one have you chosen Polly? Oh. Um, 
Oh, it's it's hard to think. Um, but I think actually I'm I'm going to read one thinking about your train. Um, uh, a, another poem about stories about place. Oh, right. uh, so this one's called A History of Flooding and also thinking about that, I guess water and the permeability um, oh, yeah. aspect. Um, but not this house, but the house we lived in before um, this house. Um, we knew when we moved in that it had flooded um, before, but only a tiny bit, but we were kind of desperate. We were being thrown out of um, a flat we were staying in. And we needed another house and it's so hard to find a house in Grasmere. Mm -hmm. I went for a meeting with someone for the job I was doing at the time and found out that they were about to leave their house. Um, so I, I kind of <laughs> attached to myself. <laughs> and then, yeah, really, so they go, oh, can, can <clears throat> um, And at the same time, I, I was told by the old boys in the pub that there was a house um, somewhere along our way where the old owner for it, the, the ex-owner, used to lift up the floorboards when it was flooding and kind of watched to have a look. water come up. Um, and much later, I found out that it was our row of houses. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, explain <clears throat> what. Um, and luckily, we moved out just a few months before Storm Desmond. So I always think oh, about well it this time of year. And again, that was accidental that our landlords had decided they wanted to sell it, the poor things. And instead, they ended up with a very, very, very flooded house. Oh, um, so this is a history of flooding. Everyone knows it, the system is broken. We knew when we took this place on, it came with a history. February last, that night, the main road filled to the thighs just north of the village sign. They went to sleep with it seeping in under the doors, woke to an inch all over like a chemical dip. There's a house, we're told, where they used to lift the floorboards, watch as the waters rose. Below our living room carpet, Concrete shrouds the ghosts of bowing beams, and the village dead crouched down to take the measure of the murky surge. The boards a raft, the cottage a heavy float. The field is a lake again, the lake a bucket spilling over in rain. The river will not stick long to its channel. It charges its margins, testing its run up, its bolt. The road out, both directions, sinking. And under the floorboards at the end of the row, the flood, unobserved, rising. That's fantastic. I love that, that little thrill of excitement you get, you know, almost like you're there and looking at it, which is it's like look, looking over a sinkhole or a, or a drop or something. It's terrifying, but it's also so compelling, isn't it? And I love the dead crouching, the village dead crouching. It's just amazing. It's stunning. It reminded me of um, um, Sean O'Brien's... Um, the Drowned Book. Oh, Have you ever read that? Do you remember there's a, yeah. there's a lot yeah. of um, that sense of the old Victorians, you know, um, yeah. the water and that's, it's got a real sense of that. Um, yeah. yeah, which is one of the first poetry books that I saw, sort of, like, fell in love with really, that, that book and that wateriness about it. I, yeah. I think also all of these things that are kind of uh, outside our power, the, like the caves um mm. flooding and all these these things kind of have have this aspect of feeling like it connects you with people who have experienced mm. those things in the past as well doesn't it absolutely it yeah. gives you a sense of kind of uh, uncanny continuity uh, mm. with people mm. who have, have lived in these places and experienced mm. the same thing mm. Mm, the predecessors yeah. yeah 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 well i guess we've come to the end of our hour um so we should uh thank each other thank you kate <laughs> fantastic to talk to you penny um sorry penny polly really sorry about that i don't think i've ever called you penny by mistake have i it's been, it's been such fun it's been such um, fun it's been really nice comparing notes about um about the world and the, and, the, rock and the, earth and the water yeah, yeah. As you can tell, we could have spoken for ages about these things as well. So um, I guess if anyone does have any follow up questions, do do feel free to um, tweet uh, about it and we'll see if we can um, answer any questions. Yeah, absolutely. It'd, it'd be a pleasure. It'd be a pleasure to talk more about it and hear more of your, your wateriness, Penny. Uh, Polly, sorry, your watery <laughs> pond. Yeah, now, now yeah, I'm going to. It's only once, it kind of gets stuck in. <laughs> I've got two guys in my in my writing group, Derek and Duncan, and without fail, I call them both Derek. Without fail, even after two years, I still call them both Derek, which is really embarrassing. Duncan doesn't mind, but I just can't seem to stop it. Once I've done it, now I've, I've done it. Anyway, Problem it's been you. a real pleasure again. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the audience for uh, listening to us as well. 
Thank yeah. you.